This is a story that on the face of it makes no sense. A hockey playing phenom out of Newmarket, Ontario, becomes the number one overall draft pick of the Detroit Red Wings in 1986. Four years later, wins a Stanley Cup with the Edmonton Oilers, makes millions of dollars. How did that guy end up broke, fighting drug addiction, and homeless? Well, TSN's Rick Westhead tells this tragic and important tale in Finding Murph, how Joe Murphy went from winning a championship to living homeless in the bush. And Rick joins us now from the provincial capital. Rick, uh, first of all, kudos to you for telling uh, such an important story so well. The book is terrific. I want to go back, though, and for those who don't remember Joe Murphy or don't know anything about him, let's start there. What made him so special early on in his either junior or university career that made people take notice and say, wow, that guy's got something? Well, to start with, Steve, uh, thank you for having me on to talk about this subject. Uh, Joe was a remarkably skilled player. This guy was among the fastest players in the National Hockey League at the time that he played. Uh, guys who played with him and coaches who coached him describe someone that would skate with abandon to the front of the net to try to disrupt a goal, into the corners, sometimes maybe elbows high. Uh, whatever it took to win a puck battle, Joe Murphy was willing to do. And obviously, as you pointed out, number one pick overall in 1986, he also came into the NHL as a winner. This, uh, he played his junior hockey in Penticton, British Columbia, after his family had moved to the west coast of Canada. And then he, instead of playing junior hockey, as so many major junior hockey, as so many hockey players do, he went the other route. And he played NCAA hockey for Michigan State and led that team to a national championship before becoming the number one overall pick. Here's his former teammate, Adam Graves, describing him in the documentary you did on this subject for TSN. Sheldon, let's roll that clip if we can. There was a reason he was, he was first overall. He was such a skilled guy, and his speed, and he had that quiet. Murphy right in, he shoots, he scores! Murphy with surprising speed, he showed it in the first period. He wasn't a small guy either. He was strong on his skates. He, he had a, a, a quiet edge to his game but he could absolutely fly. Here's Joe Murphy, and he scores! And yet, in spite of all that, Rick, he was up and down to the minors from Detroit. It was a real bumpy start for him. Admittedly, he's only in his early 20s at the time, but what was going wrong? Well, even before he hit the age of 20, Steve, he ran, ran into a problem with his first NHL coach, Jacques Demers. Demers was in his first season coaching the Detroit Red Wings and really wanted to make an impression on players. So here comes young Joe Murphy in his first NHL season, and he's actually living with the family of uh, Pat LaFontaine, of LaFontaine's parents. LaFontaine, of course, an NHL All-Star as well, uh, NHL All-Star. There's two, two airports in Detroit, and on one of the team's first road trips of the season, Joe describes how he left for the airport. The team hadn't told him that there was two airports there. He wound up going to the wrong one, missed a flight, and next thing you know, he's in the doghouse and is on his way to the minors. Uh, like I said, Demers wanted to make an impression, and Joe was one of the guys that he thought he could do that with. Both sides got very disillusioned with each other, and then, you know, Joe was only 21 years old, and the team essentially gave up on him and sent him to Mark Messier's Edmonton Oilers, which turned out to be a wonderful thing for him. Uh, they won a Stanley Cup there in 1990, and he got the final goal in the final game for the Oilers. Uh, in a game where, there they go, shoots, he scores, and Murphy hoists the Stanley Cup shortly after this. At this moment of his life and career, how were things for him? Well, I'd say that this was uh, the high point. Maybe not financially. Those days were yet to come when, in terms of when he would become a coveted free agent. But he had found the perfect team to play with. He, Like you pointed out, Mark Messier, Kevin Lowe, some real experience, a veteran pr uh, presence on that. Oilers team, Glenn Anderson, a player who, like Murphy, was known for having amazing speed. And a number of guys that I talked to who played on those Oilers clubs just talk about what it was like for young players like Murphy to come in. You know, they often ate together at Messier's apartment and talked about life and pursuits outside of hockey. Um, one, one of the players, Jeff Smith, who broke in with the team, talked to, painted a really vivid picture about how his father came into the locker room one day and basically, Kevin Lowe and Messier were asking him, like, can we get you a coffee? How many creams would you like in that? <laughs> Just a real a real family vibe in, in Edmonton, and I think that suited Joe so well. 
Now, sadly for Joe, the love did not last because not long thereafter, um, well, you described this as the turning point of his life. He got clocked in a game by a player named Sean Burr. What happened at that moment and what was the impact? It was early 1991 and Joe was coming around his own net and pick up the puck and I guess was getting ready to go on one of his patented trademark end-to-end -end rushes. The problem was you had his head down looking at the puck and Sean Burr saw this and came in and body checked him. Joe left his feet, went backwards into the end boards and the way he tells it, his face hit the boards where the plexiglass and the boards meet. Oof. He said that he had a fractured skull, uh, that uh, he wound up still playing in the game, went down on a breakaway later in the same game, but instead of shooting the puck on the net, shot the puck wildly into the corner, and then coming back on the back check, one of his teammates grabbed him by the jersey and pulled him off of the ice. Now, it's really interesting, Steve. You would think that in a case like that, a player might go to the hospital for an MRI scan or a CAT scan to see a neurologist or a neuropsychologist you know, even spent a night over in hospital, but this didn't happen. Joe continued on with his NHL team, continued on the road trip that they were on, and continued to play and began to self-medicate. Again, amazing pain that he was feeling in his head. So he took, started taking painkillers and trying to look after uh, the symptoms on his own. But I got to ask the obvious follow-up question. What was he doing back on the ice in a game where he basically you know, had his brains bashed in. Why, why was he not uh, done for the day? Well, that is an obvious question, and it's one that has come up time and again with the National Hockey League. Um, you know, we, we hear this expression, bell rung. We see players brought to when they're literally unconscious with smelling salts, given a pat on the butt, and allowed to pick up in the same play. And, it, and it's a great question. Why is this happening? What does the medical staff of NHL teams believe that others don't believe. Remember, like, boxing is an interesting comparison, Steve, because in the 1950s, there was a rash of serious injuries and deaths in the ring, so much so that in New York State, regulators introduced new rules that said that any boxer knocked unconscious couldn't get back in the ring even to train for a month, up to a month. So you could have a boxing match at Madison Square Gardens on a Friday night, a boxer knocked out, and told you are done for a month. And the very next night, you could have an NHL game at the same arena, a hockey player knocked unconscious the same way the boxer was, only this time a trainer could bring smelling salts out, wake him up, and he's right back in the play. Well, you've got Dr. Charles Tatter, who's one of the leading experts on concussions in the world. He works out of Toronto. You've got him in the book saying that the NHL has a, a kind of an ostrich with its head in the sand attitude towards injuries. What did he mean by that when he told you that? Well, what he meant is that you don't have to subscribe to the Lancet Medical Journal to understand what the leading research on brain injuries is. All you have to do is watch the news and read the newspaper. These studies have been coming out for decades, and they've been obvious for anyone to see. Whether you're a team doctor, a league doctor, um, the evidence is there. The evidence that has tied repeated brain trauma to long-term problems, neurological problems. Back in 1930, Steve, the NCAA came out with a, a, a code of conduct, a handbook for, for athletes, and it suggested that players not be allowed to return to play after several concussions. That's in the 1930s during the Depression. And those rules, I don't know that they've ever been followed by NHL teams, you know, even to this day. Let's get back to Joe's story. He uh, think things uh, don't work out in Edmonton. He wants a lot of money. They don't want to give it to him. He's traded to Chicago. One of his teammates there says, boy, there's a lot of demons in that guy. Then he moves on to St. Louis. He gets into cocaine. Uh, things got so bad, apparently, in St. Louis, Rick, he claimed at one point that he had been poisoned. What was the story there? There's a lot of stories from Joe's time in Chicago and then on St. Louis. This was a guy who, as you point out, has always kind of been beat to the beat to a different drum. You know, he is an eccentric by anyone's description. Imagine a player in such a monoculture that hockey is carrying the Celestine Prophecies book around with him for a season, talking about ast astrology with his teammates and, and other guys in the NHL. Uh, he believed he was poisoned by someone on his team, and he wound up in hospital. The doctors told him that he had actually had acute food poisoning. 
Uh, but he called his uh, father late one night saying, listen, they want to amputate my hand. I can't, I can't let them do that. What am I? He, he really, Steve, by the time he was in St. Louis, did start exhibiting some really disturbing behavior. And it's impossible, really important to point out, it's impossible to say that this is all because of the brain injuries that he suffered in the NHL. Was it because of uh, you know, self-medication? Was it because of cocaine use? Was it because of alcohol? I think all those things probably combine to, to lead to this problem that he had. But what we do know is that when Joe's NHL career finished, he filed a wrongful um, a workers' compensation case against the league, excuse me. And as part of that legal process, Joe was sent to a neuropsychologist on the West Coast in California. And he was diagnosed by a medical professional as having close concussion syndrome. So again, we do have a diagnosis that definitively linked the brain injuries that he suffered playing in the NHL to the neurological damage that he still is living with today. I want to read an excerpt from your book here, which really does reflect uh, how, how damaged goods this guy was by the time he, he's now in San Jose. And, and things got even increasingly more bizarre when he was out there. Here, here comes the excerpt. The whole game, Murph is sitting at the end of the bench and screaming at Coach Daryl Sutter, I can help you. I can effing help you. Sutter ignores him. Finally, in the third period, there's an icing and a TV timeout, and the second they blow the whistle for the icing, Joe jumps over the bench and goes to the face-off circle. He stands there with his stick down on the ice, ready to take the face-off for a full minute and a half. So the TV timeout finishes, and the guys skate to the face-off circle, and Murph is not moving. The center, who Daryl sent out, starts to skate back to the bench, and Daryl is screaming at him, losing it. Get the F back there. It was unbelievable. Murph just wouldn't come off. But then, in another game, Joe goes out for a shift and is on the ice for like four seconds, comes back to the bench, Daryl asks, what's wrong? And Murph says, Joe's tired. Joe can't play. He drove Daryl crazy. Rick, this is just not normal behavior, obviously, in, in professional sports. What do you think's going on there? Well, I think Joe is already showing some symptoms then of the mental health issues that he's still battling with today. Remember, Daryl Sutter coached the Chicago Blackhawks when Joe Murphy played in Chicago. So he wanted him later, when, when Daryl Sutter was coaching San Jose, he wanted Joe on his team. And I guess that, that, that what that says, what the takeaway is, as long as you can contribute in a professional, uh, for a professional team uh, on the ice and you're not too much of a distraction in the clubhouse or in the locker room, there's going to be a place for you. Joe clearly could still play. He was one of the leading scorers with San Jose, but by that time he was already exhibiting all kinds of disturbing behavior, shaving his whole body with the thick razor, again, talking more about astrology and uh, gorillas in Rwanda and giving all of the players in, in the locker room uh, very different nicknames. We're, of course, used to nicknames in, in pro sports, but, uh, you know, nicknames that just were coming from out of left field. To the best of your knowledge, did any team ownership, management, coach, player, anybody try to stage an intervention and get him the help that he clearly needed? I can't say whether that happened or not. I know that in Washington, uh, that Joe, uh, that the coach there was so disturbed, Ron Wilson was so disturbed by Joe's behavior that he asked him to go see a psychologist. I don't know what the results of that uh, examination were. Joe confirmed that that happened while he played in Washington. Again, Washington was very nearly the final stop in his NHL career just before he played uh, with Boston. but. Again, there's there's all kinds of things going on in this man's head, and it's impossible to say definitively that one thing led to the, the problems that he has now. Hmm. I gather after his professional career ended, you got a tip that he was living up in the bush in Kenora, Ontario, homeless. So you drove up there, and you went to look for him. And what kind of a Joe Murphy did you find when you found him? That's right. I got a tip and I reached out to Trevor Kidd. I was told that Kidd, another former NHL player, a goalie, had also heard about Joe's situation. Trevor lives in Winnipeg and he has a, a trailer in Kenora, Ontario. So we agreed, we hadn't met before, but we agreed that I'd fly to Winnipeg and that Trevor and I and a TSN crew would drive east across the border back into Ontario and we'd try to find Joe. And the agreement was that if we did find Joe, that Trevor would have a conversation with him ask what help he could offer, you know, whether Joe wanted any help, and then would make, at the end of that conversation, would explain to Joe that there was a TSM crew and that we were hoping to talk with him. And if, if 
If Joe had said, I don't want to be public about this in any way, we would not have filmed a frame with Joe. We would have turned around and come back to Toronto. But he wanted to tell his story. And then as the visits, uh, you know, as I visited Kenora more to, to understand more about Joe's story and this opportunity for writing a book presented itself, I asked Joe, are you sure that you want me to do this? Are you sure you want to go ahead with this? And Joe said, yes, it, for several reasons. First, it made him feel, uh, in his words, more relevant than he had in years. And second, he was really hoping that this would add to the conversation, the very conversation that we're having now about what the NHL's obligations are to both legal, moral, ethical, to uh, its current and its former players and to their families. So the guy you found was, was intelligent enough or capable enough of understanding and making rational decisions, yes? Yes, and again, that was not the opinion necessarily that I came up with. That was the findings of the police because Joe had already been in hospitals for a psychiatric examination in Kenora. The doctors decided that he was mentally fit to make his own decisions and released him. And I made sure that I got that same advice from Joe's lawyer uh, in Kenora, his criminal defense lawyer, because Joe was actually in the process when we met of defending himself against a charge of, uh, of assault. And his lawyer as well assured me that Joe was able to make these kinds of decisions on his own. So really, to be fair, I, I relied on professionals to reach that decision. Did it appear to you as if he were still using drugs? Yeah, it did. From time to time, I'd visit his hotel room and there would be drug paraphernalia on the bed and on the floor. Um, one of the things that was a real eye-opener was just the problem that many small and large, I suppose, as well, Canadian communities are facing right now with fentanyl and opioid use. I remember walking through the baseball park in the middle of Kenora and talking to parents who volunteered with the local Little League there, and they would tell me that before games started, that they had to walk through the infield and outfield as well as the dugout, just doing a step-by-step -step search of the field to make sure that there weren't any needles still there when their kids got ready to play. Hmm. So Joe was certainly not alone in, in the fact that he was using. Rick, let's broaden the discussion now and talk about the fact that several years ago, uh, I guess a guy who was probably the greatest player in the game at the time, Sidney Crosby, got himself concussed during the course of a game and he missed a whole year. How much, in your view, did that wake up the NHL to the notion that we really have to take better care of our players because they're the game and, you know, no stars, no players, no game? I'd love to see some evidence that it has woken the NHL up and that they do uh, show signs of wanting every player to take the time that they need to heal before they come back. But I can't help wonder whether there's different rules for a player like Sidney Crosby, who, as you say, was the best player in hockey, making, you know, $10 million a year. I wonder if the rules are different for Sidney than they are for a player who's a fourth line player making the league minimum. Let's look at the evidence, Steve. Three years ago, Eric Lindros, a Hockey Hall of Famer, uh, went to the NHL All-Star Game. And his wingman for that trip was Dr. David Mulder. Dr. Mulder has been the Montreal Canadiens' chief surgeon since the 1960s. And they sat down and they asked the NHL for a simple request. They said, will you please commit $1 million per team to researching brain injuries? It's been three years. They still don't have a response from the NHL. A million dollars, to put it in context, this is, we're talking about a $5 billion industry in good times. A million dollars would roughly pay for what a team might pay for a fourth or a third line player. You managed somehow to get a hold of internal NHL emails among very high ranking officials, the commissioner included, the deputy commissioner included. What did those emails indicate to you about the level of concern the NHL has about head injuries? Well, I think they, they paint a disappointing tale. You know, in 2007, you have one of the top lawyers for the NHL corresponding with Gary Bettman and others about what the best way forward is and whether the NHL should invest in understanding the mental health of retired players. And she writes to her colleague that uh, she'd rather leave uh, these issues like dementia to the National Football League to figure out with its retirees and, and focus on the here and now for the NHL. We've also learned that there's this really interesting transition that takes place once a player goes from current player to former player and management. And on one hand, they're in this brotherhood, these one of 700 jobs that, that hockey players in the best league in the world enjoy. But then they become management and you start to see something different. 
And I can remember, Steve, reading the meeting minute notes uh, when NHL general managers meet and seeing these former players who had become GMs ask and, and raise some interesting questions. One former player who is now a general manager was wondering whether, you know, stretchers were being brought on the ice prematurely, too early, and whether that was too dramatic and really made the game look bad. Another former player who was a general manager wondering, players who were getting up off the ice after hitting their head and, and holding their head like this, like showing symptoms of dizziness and balance problems, maybe those players were just looking for a vacation in the middle of the season. That was a really hard thing to reconcile, how that transition went from former player to the general manager. And one more, if I could. Back in 2013, the head of the Canadian Medical Association calls out the NHL in an open letter and is concerned about the number of player brain injuries. And so there's an internal discussion amongst NHL executives about how to respond to the Canadian, uh, Canadian Medical Association. And Frank Brown, a former hockey reporter who is now helping to run the PR for the league, writes to an NHL lawyer saying, don't worry, I got this. Uh, he writes that Hockey Day in Canada is coming up, and that's the perfect white noise to write a response to this imbecilic, dumbass doctor. And I thought, wow, if in private there is that much scorn for one of the top medical minds in Canada, how can you have any confidence that this is a league that really is taking this problem seriously? Well, let me just for argument's sake here put the NHL's position to you. And, and in the interest of full disclosure, you and I not too long ago were on a Zoom call with dozens and dozens of so-called hockey people. And um, Glenn Sather, you know, who's a pretty big name in NHL history, has got a bunch of Stanley Cup rings, uh, Edmonton Oilers, New York Rangers. Uh, he basically said, you're not giving the league any credit at all for the progress that it has made over the last couple of decades in recognizing this issue much more today than it once did. Does he have a point? Absolutely. And he, he has a right to an opinion, and he has a point. Is it the same as it was in the 1950s and the 1960s? No. But I would argue that the media, there's enough people doing what we do who celebrate the NHL and take the NHL's word for it when they talk about progress. One of the big things that the league holds up as a, a sign of how much it's moved into the you know future is this concussion spotter program. And for people who don't watch hockey very closely, the NHL has these spotters. And their job is to sit and watch games. And if they see players who are showing signs that they might be concussed, they're supposed to call down to the bench and have those players removed uh, to be evaluated by a doctor. But imagine the issue if it's in the final seconds of a Stanley Cup final game, and one of the star players, Austin Matthews with the Toronto Maple Leafs, or Connor McDavid with the Edmonton Oilers is holding their head after they get off the ice with a minute left in Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Final. We still don't know who the concussion spotters that the league has hired are. How can that be? If you pick up an NHL media guide, the identity of everyone working for a team in literally any capacity is public, except for the concussion spotters. So, Steve, you help me understand. Does that make any sense? Wouldn't you want to be as transparent as possible? Um, okay, having said that, how much of the issue here is that players, I don't know if this is an issue at all. You discuss it in the book and I want to get your take on it. Players, a lot of players don't seem to have much respect or regard for the fact that when they get a guy with his head down, you could be ending, never mind his career, but his life. Do you think the players' lack of respect for each other is a factor here? I think that's an open question. Uh, I'm not a hockey guy. I don't watch the game. I don't watch all the games. I don't, I'm not a beat reporter. So I don't think I'm in the, in the right position to say whether that lack of respect is an issue. What I do know is the question about the respect that players have for one another is a constant. People were asking this question in the 1970s when there was mayhem on the ice during every game. And even today, they're still asking the question. Hmm. Let's finish up on this. Do you know where Joe Murphy is now? To the best of my knowledge, uh, he's in Saskatchewan somewhere. Uh, there was a local news report, CTV, did an interview with Joe this past summer in Regina. So he had moved west from Kenora to Regina, but I haven't talked to him in, in a while. So I can only hope that as the temperature turns and it gets much colder, that he'll you know find somewhere to seek shelter and be safe. Amen to that. Finding Murph, how Joe Murphy went from winning a championship to living homeless in the bush. Rick Westhead, the author and documentary maker for TSN. Rick, it's awfully good of you to spend so much time with us on TVO tonight. Thanks so very much.
I, I really appreciate you bringing light to this and giving me the chance, Steve. Thank you. Not at all. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.